Welcome everyone to today's webinar on the highlights from the recent American Heart Association scientific sessions. Today's webinar is brought to you by No Diabetes by Heart, which is a joint initiative of the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association. The purpose of today's webinar is to recap some of the latest science highlighting strategies for cardiovascular risk management in people with type 2 diabetes. These are data released at the American Heart Association scientific sessions. My name is Jane Roosh. I'm a professor of medicine, bioengineering, and integrative physiology and associate director for the Center of Women's Health Research at the Anschutz Medical Campus at the University of Colorado. I'm also a staff physician and merit review investigator at the Rocky Mountain Regional VA uh, MC and past president for medicine and science for the American Diabetes Association. I have had the privilege of serving as one of the founding members of No Diabetes by Heart Scientific Advisory Group, and I will be moderating today's session. Before we begin, I would really like to thank and recognize the No Diabetes by Heart founding sponsor, Novo Nordisk, along with national sponsor, Bayer, and thank you for your support. We couldn't do this important work without you. We invite you to visit the No Diabetes by Heart website, nodiabetesbyheart.org, for downloadable materials that will support you in your practice will provide guideline information, case studies, and a library of earlier webinars and podcasts. We will be hosting a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Please use this Q&A session to send your questions. Put them in the Q&A box and not the chat box. That makes sure that we will address all of your questions and as many of them as possible. And we will be responding either in person or as a group, or we will respond um, by, by writing back to you on the Q&A window. It is my pleasure to welcome our esteemed panel of experts for today's webinar. We are joined by Dr. Nathan Wong, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Heart Disease Prevention Program at the University of California in Irvine. Dr. Wong is an ec ep a cardiovascular epidemiologist and specialist in preventive cardiology. The focus of his research program is the epidemiology of diabetes in relation to cardiovascular disease and strategies for cardiovascular disease prevention. He is also the past president of the American Society of Preventive Cardiology. In addition, we are joined by Dr. Chadi Numile, director of the Obesity and Cardiometabolic Research Program at John Hopkins Cardiology. Dr. Numile is the immediate past chair of the Obesity Committee of the American Heart Association and current vice chair of the American Heart Association's Lifestyle and Cardiometabolic Health Council. His research focuses on the impact of obesity and cardiometabolic risk factors in the development of cardiovascular disease, particularly heart failure and strategies for heart failure prevention. Listed on this side are our faculty disclosures. We are excited to hear from both of our expert panels today. And with that said, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Wong. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roish. And also, um, it, uh, I'd like to express my appreciation to the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, and the No Diabetes by Heart, Heart Initiative for um, making this program possible and inviting me to participate. So um, one of the important themes of this meeting was, uh, you know, the 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 problem certainly with 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 multiple risk factor control and actually disparities in achieving this, uh, you know, in terms of um, trying trying to optimize cardiovascular risk in people with diabetes. And one of the sessions that I think is um, important to um, actually highlight is one that uh, we did that uh, specifically focused on this and. 
and 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 the implications of the no di no diabetes by heart initiative. And in this session, we had um, five key presentations, and I just kind of wanted to highlight some 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 of the key points. Um, the first presentation we had talked about the um, actually epidemiologic evidence related multiple risk factor control and how that might improve um, risk reduction in people who have diabetes. We talked about how there are limitations in current um, cardiovascular risk assessment strategies, uh, such as from the various risk scores, they you know many times don't include. Um, certain diabetes specific factors that might affect outcomes. And we also, in particular, discussed um, from several lines of evidence how only about one in five people with diabetes are acceptable targets for um, three key parameters that the No Diabetes by Heart Initiative focuses on, namely LDL cholesterol, blood pressure, and A1C, but obviously there's many other factors. And if you, you know, actually look at those, for example, um, you know, if you add in non-smoking status, um, having a, um, you know, non-obese body mass index, you're you're at even a lower percentage at these targets. And we talked about how actually, you know, there's a fair amount of evidence that suggests that if if you are a target for um, these factors in particular, you can actually reduce cardiovascular event risk by more than 50%. And Peter Gade um, from Europe nicely talked about the Steno 2 study, which he, um, uh, he, he was the principal investigator on. And, you know, we have to remember the significance of that that showed that, that intensive multiple risk factor intervention reduced um, cardiovascular events over eight years by 53%. And then if you extended this, this actually after the trial phase to 13 years, you had um, about 20% 20, 20 reductions in mortality. And uh, so this was important. And he also emphasized that he was able to show that you actually can extend life cardiovascular free life by eight years if you're at these multiple um, risk factor goals. So I think this is a very, very important message. Um, Joshua Joseph then discussed, um, you know, the, the actually key pillars for um, risk reduction in people with diabetes. He specifically focused in his talk on lifestyle management, antithrombotic, glycemic, lipid management, and health equity. And importantly, um, you know, what was discussed was the importance of, of, of um, health equity issues and social determinants of health to um, making sure that, you know, we're, um, we're accomplishing these risk reductions in an equitable fashion. And what was also noted was that actually about 40% of our people with diabetes are not on any of these evidence-based therapies, and only 10% are actually on three key evidence-based therapies, namely statins, either an ACE inhibitor or ARB, as well as either an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 um, yeah, I'm actually receptor agonist. Sadia Khan, um, pointed out, um, you know, that, uh, that, you know, it's, it's extremely important that we um, continue our, you know, that we maximize on opportunities to um, prevent diabetes. And she, in, you know, in particular, reminded us of the implications of the diabetes prevention program and how, um, you know, and, and another very important point was how some of our underserved ethnic ethnic communities, you know, in 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 particular Hispanic individuals and non-Hispanic Black adults, um, are diagnosed with diabetes five to seven years earlier than than actually other groups. So there's a I I think a a, a key need to even identify their cardiovascular risk actually earlier. Um, one, one very important point that, 
that that I wanted to mention that she also reminded us of was that that there's a fair amount of evidence that shows that in order to be successful, you know, we and and this is going to be a theme throughout this webcast is that we have to have a team based approach. Okay, and we still have a long ways towards achieving that in the community and as well as the importance of multiple contacts with the patient. Uh, what she had summarized data pointing out that we need at least 10 contacts of six months duration or more in order to be successful, right? So it's no longer sufficient just to, you know, see the patient once or twice and talk to them about their risk, but we have to keep um, keep on this you, you know, this through actually multiple visits. Finally, um, actually Dr. Royce, our, our, our I'm actually chairperson this morning, um, mentioned um, uh, how, how important uh, you know these um, points are being addressed by the um, actually no diabetes by heart initiative and in this, she pointed out the key goals of this initiative, right? With, and the three, three key, key goals, improving quality of care in people with diabetes who have increased cardiovascular risk, ensuring equity in this care, also accelerating the um, team-based care models. That's gonna be an important theme of this webcast. And thirdly, better engaging people with diabetes in their actually healthcare and really empowering them to um, take more responsibility for their care. And the hope certainly is that the No Diabetes by Heart initiative is going to um, dramatically improve guideline-based care, in particular glycemic blood pressure, statin therapy, as well as um, actually kidney screening in uh, these patients, as well as to improve um, multidisciplinary communication among the actual team that needs to take care of these patients to reduce their risk. And finally, to improve patient confidence to communicate their risk to um, healthcare providers. So um, I think, you know, that, um, you, you know, I just wanted to kind of, um, recap that as an important session. Uh, certainly, um, there were also some important late break in clinical trials. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I guess I can say a little bit about the prominent trial, one of, one of those that I found most interesting. Yeah, so, so why don't you why don't you in a in a couple minutes uh, tell us about about the prominent trial, um, and then and then we're going to move to how this call to action from the sessions that you have just gone over uh, really is going to need to be implemented and some barriers and we're going to hear a little bit more about that um, from Dr. Numerlay. Okay, sounds great. So um, I, I think one of the uh, very important questions that we've been faced with over the years is whether uh, fibrate therapy is effective in reducing uh, cardiovascular event risk. And we know that over the last 15 years, there's been um, several trials during the statin era that have involve fibrate therapy, but unfortunately have failed to show a difference. However, there were um, some Im important risk reduction seen in people with high triglycerides and low HDL cholesterol from subgroup analysis of, the tr of those trials. But what, um, so that really kind of led to the actually prominent study that involved Pima fibrate, uh, that's a PPAR alpha, modulator and um, and the actually goal of this trial was to examine people um, with type 2 diabetes who had a mild to moderate hypertriglyceridemia and in particular also had a um, 
low HDL cholesterol because from the past trials, this subgroup seemed to benefit, right? So this involved over 10,000 patients and they looked at the um, composite of non-fatal MI ischemic stroke, coronary revascular revascularization, or actually cardiovascular death. And, um, and to, to many of us, it was, was a surprise. Uh, some it was uh, maybe not necessarily a surprise, but they uh, found there was absolutely no difference in the primary composite endpoint, uh, nor in any of the components of the primary composite endpoint. So a hazard ratio of 1.03, far from being statistically significant. What was interesting was that, um, and part of why this trial might have been negative was that there was actually an increase in LDL cholesterol um, in the actually Pima fibrate group. So some of us feel that that may have counteracted any um, possible benefit from lowering, lowering triglycerides. There was also, um, you know, an increase in, um, in, in um, actually adverse renal events as well as venous thrombotic events. So this, um, you, you know, this trial I think was very important because it, it really, um, many of us feel uh, was kind of the nail in the coffin, at least for trying to um, show whether uh, a management of hypertriglyceridemia from fibrate therapy specifically would actually uh, reduce um, cardiovascular events. Um, certainly in people with very high triglycerides, remember fibrates still have an important role for um, preventing acute pancreatitis, but at least um, uh, most of us feel that uh, there is uh, no longer a role for um, fibrate therapy for prevention of cardiovascular events in people with moderately high triglyceride levels. And I know um, uh, there's going to be a later later discussion in this session about the RESPECT EPA trial, and that has certainly uh, very important implications. But at least with fibrate therapy, um, there does not seem to be a benefit. Uh, this, I, I will mention that uh, Pima fibrate is still being investigated for um, possible other, other benefits, but uh, not for um, cardiovascular risk reduction. Well, thank you. And um, because I think I am really uh, uh, disastrously injuring Dr. Numile's last name. I'm going to move to front na first names for people. So I quit saying it wrong. Um, uh, so, so, so thank you, Nathan. And um, Chadi, I, uh, I, I really want to call you Dr. Numile, but I don't want to do it wrong anymore. So, um, when, when we have been talking about disparities in, in meeting cardiovascular risk prevention strategies in people with diabetes. Um, I know that you were, you were, I think, chairman of a session that was a, was a flipped classroom talking about the barriers in actually getting optimized cardiovascular risk reduction. And we would love it if you'd tell us a little bit more about that session. You're on mute. Thank you, Jane, and uh, thank you, Nathan, for that uh, uh, helpful uh, synopsis of some of the, those other uh, sessions. So I think a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, I think this year uh, there was clearly there's a growing emphasis on this construct of cardiometabolic disease and also cardiorenal uh, disease and the confluence kind of cardiorenal metabolic disease. Understanding there's this really powerful interplay between metabolic risk factors, obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, renal disease, and cardiovascular disease that's really driving a lot of our population uh, health uh, trends in cardiovascular mortality. So I think there's clearly a lot of interest in this, clearly is a huge public health imperative, and I think the programming is following uh, those realities from an epidemiologic standpoint. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Nathan, uh, you know, really uh, helpfully described the fact that there's a, a lot of great science out there. There's a lot of 
wonderful studies out there. There's also even a lot of great guidance uh, uh, from AHA and ADA and KDGO and ESC. But uh, but the real question is, how are we going to get this actually implemented uh, in uh, kind of real world clinical and real world community settings? And the flipped classroom, which was actually uh, led by Ian Neeland, our, one of my colleagues uh, in the Scientific Sessions Programming Committee, that, that session uh, really uh, kind of turned the tables. Instead of us kind of lecturing to folks, it kind of put all the guidance out there and then had more of a discussion with the experts on, you know, how are we actually going to make this work in real world settings? And the one question is first about best practices and thinking about how to move beyond what we're currently doing with regards to cardio renal metabolic care. But then secondly, um, thinking about kind of some real implementation tips for moving things forward. So in terms of best practices, it was a nice case-based session where there was a discussion of a patient that kind of the patients we commonly see with multiple uh, uncontrolled multi-system challenges. Uh, but one of the big first steps was this question of therapeutic inertia and moving past, you know, people have been historically on lots of uh, therapies that um, don't have some of the cardiovascular outcomes benefits that we're seeing from some of the newer therapies uh, that uh, that we now know about and are have the opportunity to champion. So how we kind of transition individuals towards moving them towards some of these therapies like the GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT-2 inhibitors um, and think about the different things that we're trying to accomplish. I do think, uh, so it was helpful to move towards that. There's also some very important gaps to consider. So for example, uh, in that at-risk patient, where are we actually prioritizing the SGLT2? Where are we actually prioritizing the GLP-1? Where are we saying we need to be on both? Where are we taking some additional steps for renal protection? So there's some things that we need a little bit more guidance on, but there's clearly a need to start uh, kind of uh, focusing on some of these uh, newer therapies. And that was one very important part of the discussion. Um, clearly, we are at a stage where thinking about this in a siloed fashion, as Nathan alluded to, is not making, making sense anymore. Uh, we really need to think about this in terms of shared ownership and integrated care models. And the, the panelists for this uh, session really went across all the disciplines. We had folks who were, you know, uh, uh, you know, cardiologists, but then also nephrologists and endocrinologists. And clearly there needs to be also really nice engagement of uh, internists. But on top of that, we need to also be thinking about who are the other individuals who need to be included in this care team to actually make these guidelines and these approaches a reality? What kind of navigators, what kind of uh, lay persons in the community do we need to kind of support care for individuals? So that was another important part of the discussion, thinking about this kind of integrated care team and this approach. Uh, and not just saying who owns this patient, but you know this broader question of we should all be owning this patient and we should all have these shared goals and be working together to accomplish those. Um, Interestingly, uh, one of the things that I think is the biggest barrier <clears throat> that came up time and time again is getting these therapies to patients. Uh, we know there's a lot of coverage challenges with getting some of these newer uh, therapies to patients and the question of how to do that, but there were very interesting lessons. So there's a Cardiometabolic Care Alliance and uh, Mikhail Korsport actually did some really helpful uh, discussions bringing on some of his care models towards uh, helping individuals navigate coverage and navigate getting some of these therapies and the way they work with various uh, uh, organizations to make sure individuals get connected to the therapies they need and to address coverage gaps. So that was actually really helpful as well. So it was a really lively discussion, getting real world tips on how to take the guidelines to actually implementing them in clinical and community settings. And I think what I'd love to see more of as we move forward is uh, not only more specific guidance on those individuals who are at risk and thinking about prevention and this kind of people with kidney disease and people uh, with metabolic disease, but then also how we actually make this equitable in the community setting, how we deal with these people who have lots of barriers um, and how we deal with these covered challenges. But there was a really helpful initial conversation towards that. Uh, and, uh, and it was a really lively part of the sessions uh, that was a little bit different from our traditional approaches. Yeah, so thank you. And, and I think that one of the things that uh, we can put together from these, these two sort of uh, uh, approaches is what we need to get done 
and what we can get done and to really identify those gaps of, of research and also of uh, the, the medical care infrastructure that could allow us to get from what should be happening to what, what uh, can be happening. And one of the interesting things um, that Dr. Wang's data and that uh, those who were in your flipped classroom are all experiencing is that even before we move to these transformative cardio, cardio renal and cardio metabolic health uh, tools such as the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP1 inhibitors and whatever other the future where the future of obesity treatment may lay, um, we, uh, we, we see a lot of graphs about residual risk um, but I would say one of the most compelling graphs about residual, residual risk that I have seen is in the failure to get blood pressure, glucose, and cholesterol addressed uh, at all in people uh, living with diabetes. So from the Steno2 study, yeah. what was really exciting and then also unnerving in looking at your data, Nathan, was, was that we are not getting this job done, but just in a panel of 160 patients, he was able to show that even addressing blood pressure, cholesterol, and, and, um, and uh, glucose, not perfectly, not even getting to his goals. He was already achieving that 60 to 70% improvement over time. So that we have to be messaging our, our uh, when we give a lecture about residual risk and the need to use these newer transformative therapies, we need, we need not to leave anything on the field when it comes to more bread and butter easily accessible in a disparate in, in, in populations at very high risk without good either medical uh, medical uh, medication security, access to care, um, other other barriers to care. Uh, we need to really just emphasize you know the ABCs and then and then, and, and we don't want to do it in a stepwise fashion. If, if, if Chadi, if you meet a person in the ICU, we immediately then, and they happen to also get diagnosed with diabetes, we want no delays. We want to, we want to follow the guidance that is now aligned from the AHA, ADA, ACC, ESC, you know, you meet a person with existing coronary disease or heart failure, they need to go exactly on these transformative medicines right away. But we also need to not leave that other residual risk that we are doing, at least in the United States, and that is also happening globally. Yeah. So, and, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to comment that, um, yeah, yeah, I think certainly. Um, you, you, you know, the key risk factors that we discussed is, uh, you know, you know, that we can attribute much of residual risk to those. Um, certainly, obviously, there's many, many other factors, you know, right. life, lifestyle factors, particularly um, trying to um, trying, trying to, you, you, you know, achieve weight control, um, physical activity, and and, and a whole um, list of social determinants of health that are responsible for much of this um, risk factor reduction. Um, and, and just one more comment, you know, as I had mentioned related to your point about Steno2 is, you know, that, that 160 patients, you, you know, remember Dr. Gade pointed out that this could easily be anybody's panel of patients, right, 160, um, and, and, and through that intensive risk factor reduction, he was able to delay um, cardiovascular events by actually eight years, so I think that's a very compelling message uh, and, that, yeah. you know, we have to get across. 
And I think yeah. it's important to just highlight that that uh, this therapeutic approach was not just medications, as you're saying, there was intensive lifestyle modification at the core to address all of the other aspects of residual risk and then targeted pharmacotherapies to help further achieve those goals. So this was even before we're talking about some of these transformative therapies, mm -hmm. just actually addressing all of those underpinnings of cardiorenal metabolic disease is really, really important. But think about who we're missing. The people we're going to miss are those individuals who are most marginalized, who have the most barriers. Mm -hmm. And we really need to think about in clinical environments, but also in the community setting, how do we best support that holistic care for these individuals at risk? That's really going to be the way we move the needle uh, on addressing risk in this population. I completely agree. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's move to um, to heart failure because there was yeah. a lot of work on uh, heart failure and particularly cardiometabolic risk uh, for accelerating heart failure. And so Chadi, if we were to talk a little bit about uh, the session on advances in diabetes and heart failure, and then some of the some of the pivotal trials that that we were discussing a few moments ago. Yeah, so um, you know there was there was uh, I will start with the heart failure focus. We had some really interesting uh, discussions on heart failure, and particularly in relation to diabetes. Um, and um, there was a uh, so we're all uh, uh, probably most of us familiar with the Soloist uh, WHF trial, uh, which is the combined SGLT one and SGLT two inhibition with the dramatic impact on uh, on cardiovascular events, particularly heart failure and hospitalization and mortality. Um, so this was an interesting uh, post hoc uh, analysis of soloist WHF that focused on those individuals who got therapy um, right uh, just before or at the time of discharge and demonstrated a really dramatic impact on short-term events. So 30-day rehospitalizations and 90 days, both rehospitalizations and mortality and cardiovascular events in those persons really indicating, as you're just describing, this question of a delay. Uh, that there's probably going to end up being some benefit to kind of early institution of these therapies where we know we're going to have the greatest benefit. So that was a really helpful uh, post hoc analysis uh, of that trial. Um, in terms of another trial that had an interesting post hoc analysis within DECLARE uh, TIMI 58, there was a very interesting uh, study looking at biomarkers uh, and uh, demonstrating that the, the variability in NT ProBMP in particular, there was also some for troponin, but that there was remarkable var uh, variability of NT ProBMP over six months in relation uh, to receiving SGLT2 inhibition. And that basically those individuals who had the greatest increase in the in the uh, antiprobium P over time and or the greater increase in uh, troponin over time, and certainly both had dramatically increased risk for developing heart failure. So actually speaks to the idea that these biomarkers could actually help us in some kind of precision ways in thinking about uh, how we understand people's responses and thinking about monitoring for longer term heart failure risk. And then on another side of biomarkers, we had some interesting proteomic data from the ERIC study um, demonstrating uh, some very interesting relationships of proteomics uh, in diabetes to heart failure and finding a series of proteins uh, that seem to be specifically associated with the development of heart failure among individuals with diabetes. Um, so that is very interesting because that could be setting the stage for some future either prediction approaches or even future therapeutic approaches that may be specific to uh, kind of diabetic cardiomyopathy or the development of heart failure and diabetes. So kind of setting the stage for some future science in this area. So there was a lot of very interesting science on these concepts of uh, what are some of these underlying mechanisms leading to heart failure and diabetes? And then also what are some of the strategies we're gonna think about for optimally monitoring these individuals and thinking about the early implementation of some of these newer therapies for reducing or optimizing uh, cardiovascular outcomes in this population. Yes, and, and along that line, there was a, um, even though it had been presented, the, the top line results had been presented elsewhere, there were some of the breakdown products of Empikidney presented, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit yeah. about that. Yeah, we had some really interesting late-breaking science. So the Empikidney trial uh, was a really helpful addition. We 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 know now that uh, these the SGLT2 inhibitors are, are helpful among individuals at risk for developing heart failure. We know 
that we see uh, some uh, real benefits among individuals with existing heart failure, but now the EMPA kidney actually expanded this now to thinking about patients who just are uh, selected based on CKD, a portion of them having diabetes, a portion of them having CBD, but not all of them. Um, and really it was based on CKD and seeing, do we see a reduction in the composite of progression of kidney disease and uh, and uh, cardiovascular uh, events. And the trial was quite positive. It was a, you know, a positive trial. Importantly, most of the outcome benefit over two years was driven by uh, the reduction in car uh, chronic kidney disease prevention, which is known to be a, a really helpful effect of these agents. Um, so that's important. All of the cardiovascular events were moving in the same direction. So we did see, uh, kind of nominal reductions in those, but they were not statistically significant. But this is only at two years, and really the trends are similar to what we're seeing from the other trials. So I wouldn't be surprised if after we see, you know, four and five-year event data, we'll see uh, maybe more robust cardiovascular ones. But the composite overall outcome was strikingly positive and speaks to the fact that now we should be thinking of these agents in people, not just based on diabetes, but also in individuals with CKD. And we already know that there are kind of class one agents for individuals with existing heart failure as well. So just expanding the landscape of who we should be thinking about these therapies for. That was a really helpful trial. Yeah. And, and I think um, in terms of, of really sort of thinking through what we're what we're learning and thematically and why no diabetes by heart is such an important initiative is we're seeing that an agent that was originally designed for glucose lowering is having renal effects is having cardiac effects and is really bringing together the integrative physiology of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and this sort of composite cardiorenal, cardiometabolic renal, however you want to say it, um, risk. So I did want to then move to one of the root causes of, of, cardio, of excess uh, cardiorenal disease in the population, which is obesity. Hmm. And we had learned in the last few years uh, in studies uh, presented at many meetings, including the AHA meeting and the ADA meetings, uh, are that, that it is really important if we want to have true remission of diabetes or prevention of cardiovascular events, we learned from metabolic surgery studies that it was, you know, you really needed to get to about a 10 to 15% weight loss uh, and you needed that to be a durable weight loss in order to really prevent cardiovascular renal disease progression, fatty liver disease progression. And, uh, and we didn't really, we didn't have pharmacological strategies to achieve those goals. Things have really changed in the recent landscape with, with studies that have come out. And um, uh, Chadi, I wanted you to talk to us a little bit about some of the studies where we've learned some things and where we hope to learn some things as we look forward to the next, next year's meeting and beyond. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a whole new landscape for obesity pharmacotherapy. And, you know, with the higher dose uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, as we saw in the uh, in the really powerful step one trial, we are seeing that we are able to uh, hit that threshold that you're describing where we might expect to see cardiovascular benefit uh, with these agents and being fairly well tolerated um, in that setting. So a dramatic uh, impact of the of the high dose semaglutide. Um, and then now uh, we have the uh, uh, terzepatide, GLP-1, GIP uh, receptor agonists showing even greater um, uh, weight loss and seeming to be durable as well. All of these associated with improvements in uh, multiple metabolic risk factors in this degree that we would expect to see. Uh, but now uh, we're going to be looking to uh, understand what that means from a cardiovascular events standpoint. So there was a very exciting session on uh, these agents and starting to think about where we should be using them, how we should be using them, uh, you know, just the kind of nuts and bolts and the know-how and uh, any kind of contraindications, but just really expanding our horizons in terms of using these therapies in these persons who are uh, not doing well enough with lifestyle modification alone or have obesity with uh, multiple cardiovascular or with uh, comorbidities and showing that these are going to be an effective uh, and durable approach for reducing obesity. 
next year, uh, we're going to have, uh, I think, a very exciting next step, which is the SELECT trial, um, which will be focused on uh, the use of high-dose semaglutide GLP-1 receptor agonist in individuals with uh, obesity and just cardiovascular disease, uh, sorry, just cardiovascular disease and obesity without uh, diabetes necessarily or other uh, factors into seeing whether or not we can actually see the same kinds of reductions in cardiovascular events that we've seen with bariatric surgery, uh, that will obviously be very, very, very exciting uh, for the field. So I think that that next step is one that we're all eagerly looking forward to at AHA 2023. Um, okay. But yeah, sorry, please. Yeah, so let's talk about uh, one of the really big um, goals of No Diabetes by Heart, which is to get all of this incredible new data and emerging data to the, to the patients at risk. And what are what are you seeing right now as the barriers um, as we move? Let's say we've gotten all of the cardiovascular disease uh, sort of standard ABCs. We we have them to goal. People know what to eat. They're they're eating what they're supposed to eat. They're sleeping when they're supposed to sleep. They're they're not sitting in a chair and they are doing physical activity. So these are these fantastic things that we've gotten done, we've gotten accomplished, we've interfered with the community, we have changed the status quo. Yeah. What is are the other what are the barriers to the use of these new agents, both on the practice side as yeah. well as on the patient side? Yeah, so maybe I could just um, uh, um, take take a stab at that first. Is you know I I think one of the problems is that we we have to get both patients and 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 physicians to realize that these are much more than glucose lowering agents, right? These are cardiovascular risk reducing agents, and and as you nicely pointed out, Chatty, we are seeing um, pretty good reductions in, you know, in both blood pressure and improvements in lipids from these therapies as well. So, um, so we, we need to get people to really think that, you know, to realize that these are cardiovascular risk reducing agents. Um, you know, one of the challenges, of course, is, is to identify, you know, who should be on these therapies, and 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 I think that you know we have real opportunities uh, with our information systems, particularly the the um, electronic medical records, to um, be able to query um, those those patients that are seen 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 by by um, each of their doctors who um, who. Um, should be on these therapies according to guidelines, but are not on these therapies. So I I think first we need to, you know, be able to communicate who should be on these therapies and better communicate to our providers what are the guidelines that support the um, use of these therapies because I think many are are just you know not aware that for example they can be considered irrespective of your a1c or irrespective of whether you're on metformin use so there's key messages that have to get get better communicated to um to the the um, healthcare community yeah so chadi yeah, I was going to say, I, so I agree. I think that we we certainly need to uh, provide updated guidance, particularly as these uh, um, new trials and studies and uh, very promising data come out. So I think that'll be helpful. Um, currently, uh, obesity, which is the underpinnings of most of what we're talking about, is uh, dramatically under addressed in clinical encounters. Um, and part of that is because of uh well, several things. One is uh, just physician comfort and know-how. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't, this is not something that we've traditionally emphasized within our kind of 
medical education or continuing medical education approaches. So I think that's something that we can continue to do. Uh, and I think the guidance of you know, updated guidelines helps from that standpoint as well. Um, I also think that we have a lot of stigma around these challenges in, uh, and particularly in clinical environments as well. And I think uh, doing a better job of understanding that these are challenges that are complex and there's often a lot of social determinants and physiologic determinants that go into the development of obesity and the maintenance of that over time um, that go beyond just individual responsibility and choice. Uh, and I think that there are real challenges in terms of coverage and barriers, particularly for those individuals who are uh, more and more marginalized uh, communities and have uh, more challenges with access. So there's a lot of questions I see around the questions of yeah. social determinants mm -hmm. and coverage. I think we need to be incorporating that into more of our models uh, and thinking about that as we're engaging with these individuals, but then also saying, how can we actually uh, circumvent or overcome these coverage gaps for these agents. I think that's going to be a key imperative because once we start, if we if particularly if we see improvements in cardiovascular event rates, um, mm -hmm. this is going to be a huge imperative uh, to make sure we're getting this to the people who need it most. Yeah. So, Chadi, let's follow up on that. Um, you have uh, quite a bit of expertise in social determinants of health, and um, is there something that you might? Rep, uh, recommend a tool that you might recommend to help people identify uh, patients at the highest risk because uh, physicians just like they're uncomfortable talking with a patient about obesity or even understanding the language about is it okay if we talk about obesity let's talk about strategies what do you what do, what are you worried about we, we are also very poor as practitioners in, in asking the questions about social determinants of health. And that is embedded stigma, that that's really important. So can you recommend a tool that we might make available on the No Diabetes by Heart um, website uh, that we could use a simple screening tool in clinic? Yeah, there's a couple of holistic tools. Um, they're not as, we don't have actually great tools that are specifically focused on those individuals with diabetes, but mm -hmm. I do think that there are a couple of kind of holistic tools, some from uh, CDC, from some from NIH that are kind of focused more on just holistic assessments of everything from uh, kind of uh, food insecurity to uh, barriers in the kind of neighborhood setting uh, that kind of get at the broader assessment of social determinants of health. So I can put a couple in, in chat maybe that we can kind of think about uh, as uh, things that we will assess for, for the future. Um, I will also uh, say that there are some very, um, not to apply from patient to patient, but there's some of the things that we, if we don't have information from individuals, we're thinking more and more about taking into account social vulnerability indexes and area deprivation indexes as some of the kind of epidemiologic tools that we're starting to use in populations to more to better refine our calibration and prediction of risk as well. But I do think that as a general rule, we need to be thinking a little bit more about what are the factors that are uh, that are preventing individuals from meaningfully engaging with the health system, and then also being able to access, to have a healthy lifestyle and access uh, uh, some of these newer therapies that we're talking about. Yeah, so I wanna uh, tackle a question by Estelle Carter. And this is a question that I feel um, sort of is, is importantly stated, which is, you know, I typically set a goal of less than 130 over 80 for most of my patients with diabetes and hypertension. However, some of my colleagues are okay with 140 over 90. And I think that this is a, an area where, where uh, the guidelines sometimes get in a way of patient care. So the ADA, the ACC, the AHA, EAS, ESC, um, all have a guideline. And there are very subtle differences in some of these statements. Um, but, but the bottom line is we need to be addressing blood pressure. So the language in the, after the SPRINT top trial, many of the guidelines evolved to say 130 over 80 would be your target, particularly in people with diabetes and um, hypertension, actually all hypertension. And so um, that 130 over 80 guideline is, 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 has increased uh, the global prevalence of, of hypertension, which is the leading promoter of all cardiovascular death globally 
globally, um, you know, to, to I think it was 1.3 billion people um, uh, having a, a hypertension diagnosis. Now, now, if you get into the details of this guidance, when you're talking about uh, when you're when you're monitoring people and and you're seeing their blood pressure go up, first you need to measure the blood pressure correctly. Second, you need to um, you need to be working with the person, as you've heard throughout this conversation, on on lifestyle changes, on decreasing salt in the diet, on increasing physical activity, decreasing sedentary time. You need to um, and, and and then and then you need to uh, start medications. You need to not delay, just like we as diabetologists are saying, I'm not, I don't want to delay lowering your A1C. I don't want to delay lowering your blood pressure. But it doesn't mean I don't want to delay giving you a medication for your blood pressure. What I need to do is treat your blood pressure and follow it up. And if you have um, particularly cardiovascular risk and persistent blood pressure higher than 130 over 80 or or even above 1, 1, 140 over 90, then you're going to go early to a medication because if somebody then miraculously loses weight or intentionally loses weight, um, we we are are then going to be able to stop some of those medications. But we don't want to delay initiating medications. So the the it's not that anybody should be okay with 140 over 90 it's that these conversations need to be happening even as you see a blood pressure creeping up from 120 to 130 you're having these conversations about behavioral interventions if they have other other conditions that require medications you may choose a medication that also lowers blood pressure and then in the right person who who needs blood pressure lowering, you need to you need to treat them. Uh, and 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 if their blood pressure is even higher, 160, 160 over ninety or something like that, you might use a combination blood pressure lowering agent. So the point is get that blood pressure addressed, not what is the subtlety. If, if somebody's hovering between 130, 130 over 80 and 140 over 90, you need to be addressing their blood pressure yeah. and not yeah. wait till and next I, visit. Yeah. I agree. No, I think your comments, Jane, uh, remind me of three points. First of all, an old Framingham uh, study from Vassan and colleagues about 20 years ago that showed that, you know, when, when your blood pressure is creeping upwards and is in a pre hypertensive stage, a, a number of these people are going to develop clinical hypertension even within four years. So, 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 you know, I think you're absolutely right. And we have to emphasize to our patients, you know, that it's that, that, that um, hypertension is the leading cause of death in the world. And, um, and, and it also um, reminds me to point out that, you know, what we don't oftentimes appreciate is that, that um, many of these individuals, even if they're, you know, in the 130 range, they may have um, mask hypertension, right, which is more common in people with diabetes and metabolic syndrome, right? So their blood pressure is elevated at night and during during the day, maybe more so than in the clinic. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so I think the 130 over 80 uh, cut point is extremely important to initiate treatment. And you know, and and then finally, the point about not not delaying um, therapy, and in particular, right as as we know, our guidelines point out that if your blood pressure is 20 systolic or 10 diastolic above target. So that would be a systolic of 150 or higher or a diastolic of 90 or higher to start with combination therapy or a fixed dose combination, right? To, to, um, to because most of these people are going to require multiple therapies to get their pressure under control. So I, I think it's very important. 
Uh, so, uh, so we have just a few minutes left. So Chadi and I, and I have a, another question we'll come to. So Chadi, go go now. Okay, I'm I typing be, I want, answers to other questions. Yeah, I want to be quick. I was trying to see if I could put in the chat, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of a screening tool, uh, one tool from a social determinant standpoint, there's the Accountable Health Communities Social Needs Screening Tool. Um, that could be a nice starter for getting a holistic assessment of social determinants of health. And I think it's something helpful to a validated tool to apply in clinical practice. And I just wanted to, I forgot to touch on one late-breaking clinical trial that was important, uh, which is the uh, RESPECT EPA trial. So I'll just really quickly say that uh, that was an important trial because there's been this big debate about EPA versus EPA DHA and are any of these omega-3 uh, supplements uh, beneficial? Uh, I think the RESPECT EPA trial had some limitations, but it seemed to show a, a tendency towards reduced cardiovascular events in the people who were getting EPA. EPA um, uh, in this trial again, which would go along with what we saw from Reduce It and what we saw from Jealous before it, Strength and Omami that were negative trials were EPA DHA combinations. So I think that in those patients with uh, at high risk, uh, in this trial it was more secondary prevention, but then also those individuals with diabetes and multiple risk factors, EPA. Um, may be a beneficial approach, particularly for those patients with hypertriglyceridemia, where the fibrates may not be quite as effective. So seems to support, that's, that was a helpful trial that seems to support that EPA aspect of cardiovascular risk reduction. Yeah, and a very brief comment about that that I have as well is that, you know, I think most experts do agree that because this um, study was actually done in, done in Japan, uh, mm -hmm. the yes. It was probably underpowered for yep. events, and even yes. though it it dismissed the primary endpoint in terms of statistical significance, it did achieve the um, secondary MACE endpoint. So, um, you know, you know, so certainly most people do believe that it supports the um, the the um, actually findings from the reduce it trial, and 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 that it provides for a stronger case for. Uh, pure icosapen echo therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Lisa uh, Lisa Ramos has been asking a couple of really fantastic questions in the chat here uh, regarding um, barriers to people in marginalized community and the likelihood, as you mentioned briefly, Chadi, but may expand upon a little bit, of excess obesity in these high risk populations with food insecurity. So maybe a comment here on those questions. No, I think that we uh, we need to, so first of all, be providing, uh, so we need to understand that the greatest cardiometabolic risk we often see in, in marginalized communities, uh, we need to be doing broader screens of social determinants of health. And it looks like the staff are gonna put that screening, uh, social needs screening tool in the chat for people to be able to look at. And I think that we probably also need to investigate beyond an integrated care team and individuals outside of that team that can further address barriers. So uh, kind of patient navigation and community health workers, other kind of uh, 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 persons in the, in the care team that can more broadly address uh, these challenges that people in our most marginalized communities face. So I think we need to at least be thinking about this as part of our, our, our care for optimal care for patients in our, in our clinical and community populations. Okay, one quick answer to Blaze, uh, and I'm sorry about your last name, but Dugon, I, you know, I used to speak French, but um, uh, is, uh, is it wrong to start SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists in prediabetes? Well, the only one with a clinical indication in obesity where you may or may not have prediabetes would be a GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, unless there was a renal issue or, or a heart failure issue, you don't have a clinical indication for um, an SGLT2 inhibitor, which is not going to cause as much weight loss as, as the GLP-1 agents. Um, uh, and another quick question about uh, carbohydrate restriction as a strategy strategy for triglyceride reduction. Um, absolutely, that, that's our number one go-to. Uh, but if a patient has persistent uh, triglycerides above 500, we would want them on a fibrate for that for pancre pancreatitis risk. This is not a cardiovascular, uh, that's more of a me as an endocrinologist uh, answer. So we'll give a quick answer there. Um, um, but I'm going to go uh, 
we have we have a I think I'm supposed to do some sort of a wrap up right now. Um, somebody could uh, tell me that. Uh, so we didn't answer all the questions, but what I really want to say is first off, thank you to our sponsors for um, allowing us to put together these programs. And I am trying to, uh, I've had to move between many screens right now. Um, I wanna say thank you to our wonderful panelists. I, I want to tell you that this was a broad ranging conversation of a meeting where the AHA is now having many, many more sessions related to cardiometabolic health. Following the, this webinar, you will receive an email with a link to complete a brief survey. We would love you to complete that survey so we can get feedback and also tell us future uh, topics that you would like for no diabetes by heart to be addressing. Thank you for your engagement and for your dedication to the care of people with and at risk for diabetes and cardiometabolic disease.